Welcome aboard! So you've decided to come aboard and sail on Commander Territories. Whether your goal is gold, glory, or simply a fun trip, this deck will get you there. First off is your commander. You're running Admiral Baggett Brass, which is a 4-mana 3-3 that gives all of your other pirates plus 1 plus 1. At the beginning of your own step, you gain control of target online permanent, controlled by a player who has dealt combat damage by 3 or more pirates this turn. She's not that good. The plus 1 plus 1 that you give all the other pirates is good, but her second ability is probably never going to trigger, and if it triggers, you're not going to get anything that good. I have played roughly 50 to 60 games using this deck, running her as a commander, and I've triggered her effect maybe 3 or 4 times. You have win conditions in this deck that are just better than her ability. But she is the only pirate commander that we have because Azor took the pirate commander spot in Rivals of Ixalan, so we're stuck with her. But if you honestly wanted to run a more competitive version of this deck, you would run Marchessa the Black Rose, which is also a 4-mana Grixis 3-3 with the throne, which says whenever this creature attacks the player with the most life, or type for the most life, put a 1-1 counter on it. You're not going to be hitting with her that much, but you sh you she gives all of your other creatures dethrone as well. So all of the pirates that you choose to attack with to trigger your raid abilities or to suicide for tokens, you get right back at the end of the turn, which is really good and it keeps you alive and it maintains your blocker. But since this is commander, I choose to put flavor above the actual utility of the cards, which you're going to notice throughout this entire deck deck, I have chosen pirate themed cards over cards that would honestly be better suited for their use. Pirates like to do one of two things, and that is collect treasure and pillage. So your main win condition is to acquire as much treasure and bounty as you can and end up winning with Revel and Riches. Revel and Riches is a 5 mana enchantment that whenever a creature and opponent dies, you create a colorless treasure artifact token with tap it, sacrifice it, add 1 mana of any color to your mana pool. These treasure tokens end up being able to ramp you to higher mana totals so you could play more pirates and stronger enchantments and stronger. They're mainly there because they trigger a lot of other cards that care about artifacts. And it's a win condition. It creates treasure tokens on its own and if you control 10 of them, you win. You don't want to play this unless you have already controlled a bunch of treasures. There have been games where I have one or two treasures, I'm behind by a lot, I play Revel and Riches and then everybody else playing hits me kills me before they can trigger Revel and Riches. Because they can't do any board clears, they can't fight. Because if you put Revel and Riches on the field, and your opponent targets another opponent for an attack, and they block, two of their creatures died, it doesn't benefit either of them, it benefits you. So it's an amazing condition, but it's very glass candy, because if they destroy it with any enchantment removal, you have no win condition. Which then comes to these three backup win conditions, which are Kindred Charge, which is a four colorless, th two red, for sorcery, it says choose a creature type, which will be pirates. For each creature you control of the chosen type, you create a token that's a copy of that creature. Those tokens gain haste, and you exile them beginning of the next end step. This not only copies all of the pirates that you have, but any of the pirates that boost each other. For example, the Deadeye Neckbreaker that gives all of your other pirates plus two attack whenever they attack. You are suddenly getting plus four attack for every pirate that you attack with. You have any, if you manage to put Admiral Beckett Brass on the field, they all get plus two plus two. For redundancy sakes, you run, you run an Archetype of Imagination, which is four colorless, two blue, for an enchantment creature, human wizard, creatures you control have flying, and creatures your opponent control lose flying and can't have or gain flying. Basically makes all of your creatures unblockable, you can swing for games, it finishes off really quickly. You have to make sure that you are, you have enough damage on the field to at least eliminate one or two people on the table. Or if you really need to, at least take out the strongest person on the table so you are back in control. You also run Open Into, open into Wonder, which is more for early game. If you need to reload your hand and you need to hit somebody for a couple of bit of damage, it is X and 2 blue. Extra creatures can be blocked this turn. Into the end of turn, those creatures gain. Whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, you draw a card. So if you have like one or two pirates on the field, maybe three or four, play Open Into Wonder, draw some cards, refill your hand, and you're back into the tempo of the game. Or you can use late game to make everything unblockable and just swing for game. Now, as for the actual creatures in this deck, they fall into one of three categories, and that is combat, value, and treasure. First, we're going to be looking at damage. These are the creatures that hit really hard and boost your other pirates so they can hit even harder. You have Stormfleet Slosh Brother, which has Ascend, 2 mana 2 2, and whenever you have the City's Blessing, you gain Double Strike. Which in Commander is very easy because you run a lot of Signets, Soul Rings, Artifacts a lot of land, and the actual meta is very slow compared to standard. So you're going to get Ascend pretty quickly, and since he's a creature, he will continuously search, well not search, it'll continuously check to see if you have the City's Blessing. And Double Strike on a 2-2 is pretty good. You have Headstrong Pooch, the 3 mana 3-3 three, three with Menace, if you control another pirate, which will. He can't block, but you're not going to be blocking that much anyway. You're going to want to attack with all of your creatures, 
every turn as long as you can. Tire Flea Poisoner is a 2 mana 2-2, two, two, Flash, Death Touch, and if you're attacking, she gives another pirate plus one plus one against Death Touch. She will remove almost anything in the game that it doesn't have indestructible. You can block with the little pirate, flash her in before your turn starts, give it Death Touch, you kill something that's really strong and you stop people from trying to hit you. Because people know that you could have a Dire Flea Poisoner in your hand and you have one or more sources of untapped black mana, they're not going to want to attack you that much. Fathom Captain, he just creates 2-2 two, two treasure, I mean 2-2 two, two pirate tokens with menace. You're going to have 2 mana lying around a lot, especially mid to late game. You're going to be making a lot of tokens if you keep him and you keep attacking all the time. He has menace, so if you drop him out turn 2, he's not getting blocked anytime soon. He's not. If you somehow manage to run out of pirates or run out of creatures to play on turns 3, 4, and 5, which you're probably going to die, but he'll keep you alive a little bit by creating 2-2. Two, two, tokens with mana. You run and carry Zev's Cash of Raider, which is the 2 mana, 1, 3, first strike and menace, and whenever she attacks, she creates a 2, 1 red creature token that is also attacking. You exit the token. She spreads your damage out pretty well. The t monkey token d isn't a pirate, so it doesn't get boosted, but it's still a good little attacker if you want to get through early blockers. First strike is really good, especially if you can boost her up. Menace is also really good. She's just a really good pirate card. Never want to cut her out of the stack. The Evan Dire Flea Neckbreaker, this is the card that you're going to want to tutor for the most with your 400 of the Coalition. She gives all other pirates you control plus 2 plus 0. There was a lot of debate whether that should have been plus 1 plus 1, but pirates are really combat heavy and the plus 2 attack really adds up. Because you're in the mid game, you play your turn 4, you could possibly get it, be getting another 6, 8, sometimes 10 damage on just from her effect, even if she doesn't have charge. I mean, haste. Then you have Storm Fleet, Finisher, Storm Fleet Sprinter, which is a 3 mana 2-2, two, two. haste, can't be blocked. She is the way you're getting your, your early raid triggers out, is by just popping her down, attacking, and then just playing anything that needs raid to trigger. She's not going to get blocked, she's a very good person to use your boost on, it'll be great. Tire Fleet Captain is 1 black and 1 red for 2-2, two, two, and whenever he attacks you get plus 1 plus 1 for every other attacking pirate. He's really good mid game, really bad out of the game. You don't want to put him down turn 2 because he's not that strong, he's not really hitting for much, and he's no different than a Stormfilling Swashbuckler at that point. That's it for your damaging pirates. These pirates alone will pump out a lot of damage over time. I used to run more damage heavy pirates, but over a lot of playtesting I've cut some of them out because you don't need that many. You're boosting each other by a lot, and you're pumping out a lot more damage, especially with Kinder Charge and other cards, so these seem to be enough. Now we're going to look at treasure producing pirates. These pirates get off your Revel and Riches and they also ramp you and color fix you. Because the treasure tokens can't be tied for any color, they basically allow you to play the three colors of Grixis without running that many lands. This deck only runs 35 lands as opposed to the usual 38 to 40 lands because the treasure tokens just fill the gap for that land. Most of your mana curve is around the 2 to 3 range, so you only need that many land. First one is Sailor Means, just a 3 mana 1-4, early, early blocker, gives you a treasure token, you could play a, I mean a 5 drop on turn 3 afterwards, very good. Dire Fleet Hoarder is a 2 mana 2-1, two when it dies, gets a token. These are really good whenever you manage to steal something to revive them with, they'll just come back on the field, create another treasure token, leave the field, create another treasure token, they're great. Dead Eye Plunderers is a 5 mana 3-3 three, three, that gets plus 1 plus 1 for each artifact you control, and it, for 4 mana it'll create another treasure token. He is not only boosted by treasure tokens, he is boosted by your soul rings, your signets, your weapons, your ships, any vehicles. They will boost him up. He gets really big really fast. I've dropped him down turn 7 and he is a 15-15. Which a big beater in commander isn't that good, but it really stops you from attacking you that much because you can block with something really heavy. And the longer you have him out on the field, the more treasure tokens you're going to get, the bigger he's going to get, and it's great. And if you don't have any cards to play, you could just start pumping more tokens out. Next we have Rules of Save, which is a 3 mana 3-2, three, with 3 mana sacrifice a creature, create 2 tokens. It's not that good of an effect, but the second effect, which you sacrifice 3 treasures to draw a card, is really good late game. This deck pumps our cards and pumps them out fast, and you ramp for mana really quickly, but your hands become empty really fast. So having an effect like that that draws you another card is really good. Then we top that off with Captain Lannery Storm, which is 3 mana, 2-2 two, two with haste. Whenever she attacks, you get a token, and when you sacrifice a token, she gets plus 1 attack until end of turn. She doesn't get that big, the second effect doesn't trigger that much, because most of the tokens that you're going to want to pop off are either during combat... I'm sorry, they're not during combat, they're before combat, which means people are going to be really easy to block, or they're going to want to block, or you can't really cheat off the 
plus attack, because if you throw her out, they don't block her, and you sacrifice like five treasure tokens, all that mana is getting wasted the second you go back into your main phase two. But if she goes unanswered, you're going to be producing a treasure token every single turn. And if you're a verbal and riches out on the field, she can guarantee you a win in about ten turns. Which won't happen because they'll stop her, but she's really good for what she does. For three mana, she does a lot, and she's a good backbone for treasure producing creatures of the stack. Now we're into the value-oriented creatures. These creatures draw you cards, search cards, deal damage directly. They just do a lot. First one is a one mana, one one flying. Silence Throne Watcher, you tap it. I mean, not you tap it, you pay one blue. Counter target spell ability that targets you. Anything's trying to kill one of your creatures, just sack this. You're good, you're safe. Protect your big pirates. Daring Saboteur is a two mana, two one. Every time it deals damage, you draw a card, you discard a card. Paying three mana to make her unblockable is really good. Just a lot of value in her. Then you have Siren Lookout, which is a 3-mana 1-2 flying. When it enters the battlefield, explores. Exploring is really good in this deck because you're either going to pseudo-scry for the cards you don't need and you do need, or you're going to get a land, which you don't run that many of, so it's not going to happen that often. But getting even to a 2-mana, to a 3-mana 2-3 with flying is really good. It'll be fine. Dead Eye Tracker, he is amazing for decks that revolve around cheating stuff out of the graveyard, which means if they want to cheat out of really big creature, Dead Eye Tracker, you could just... Pay to tap it in response, exile whatever they were planning on summoning, you're good. You also get to explore out of it, which is great. With Multiplayer Commander, you have more graveyards to exile from. So having for anybody to have two cards in the graveyard is very easy, especially since this is a format where fetch lands are run a lot. He's really good for the cost. Two mana's not that much. Tapping him isn't much. You're not going to attack with him that much often. That often. He's great. Next up is your Forerunner of the Coalition, which is a three mana 2-2. Two -two. Searches any pirate, puts it on top of your deck. Sure, it eats a card, but you have most of your utility pirates, you only have one of. For example, if you're running against Graveyard Heat, you're going to want to get that Eye Tracker. If you're running against the Counter Heavy Deck, you're going to want to get Siren Storm Watcher. If you need to do a lot of damage, you're going to get your Neckbreaker out. Put it on top of your deck, you draw it next turn, you're fine. And whenever another pirate enters the battlefield under control, each opponent loses one life. That effect starts adding up a lot. Because people will ignore her at first, because they'll just think she's a blocker, I mean a searcher. They'll leave her alone, they'll think, oh, it's one damage, it's not that much. But then out of nowhere, you're just summoning three, four, five pirates. They're losing a lot of life. Late game, she can close the games up and you're just spamming little pirates. It's fine. She's wonderful, one of the best cards in the entire deck. Then you have Freebooter, which is two mana, one, two with flying. When it enters the battlefield, target opponent reveals his or her hand. You choose a non-creature, non-land card from it. Their mana ramp, their mana rocks. Get rid of them. Exile that card until Kaiser Freebooter leaves the battlefield. You're never going to attack with Kaiser Freebooter because whatever card you're taking out of their hand is usually what they need. Usually just summon it, take something out of their hand, doesn't even go to their graveyard, just exile it, leave Kites of Freebooter on the side, don't block with it, don't attack with it, just let that be. You have Ruin Raider, which is a 3 mana, 3 2 orc pirate with raid at the beginning of your end step. If you attack with a creature this turn, reveal the top card of your library, put it into your hand, you lose life equal to the cards converted to mana cost. This is a Deathrite Shaman for people that don't want to pay for Deathrite Shaman. You also don't need to run green very good. You don't always trigger it. You can choose to trigger it if you attack or not. Your overall mana curve is around 2-3 to three range, like I said before, so you're not going to be taking a lot of damage. Unless you get really unlucky, flip a, bla a Blasphemous Act, kill yourself, which has actually happened to me on one occasion. But drawing an extra card every turn is really nice, because there's not going to be a turn when you don't want it to attack. Then you have Dead Eye Brawler, which is a 4 mana 2-4 with Death Touch, and Ascend. Whenever Dead Eye Brawler deals combat damage to a player, if you have the City's Blessing, you draw a card. You don't have to discard, it's not a looting effect, you just straight up, you draw a card. Then you Protein Raider, which is a 3 mana, 2 2 creep shapeshifter pirate. With raid, if you attack with the creature this turn, you may have Protein protein Raider enter the battlefield as a copy of any creature on the battlefield. This is amazing in Commander, because if they have some really big indestructible Hector creature or something with haste, anything at all in the field that is a threat to you, you now have a copy of it. Any enter the battlefield triggers, I believe, activate when. This is played as it enters the battlefield as a copy of any creature, so it also copies its enter the battlefield facts. Everybody that I've played with has kind of ruled it that way. I'm not exactly sure what the official ruling is, but if it's not that way, it's still a really good card. Always one about it. And the final value or into pirate is Hostage Taker, which is a 4 mana 2 3. When it enters the battlefield, you exile target artifact or creature until a hostage leaves the field. You may cast that card for as long as it remains exiled, and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any type to cast it. She's going to steal their soul rings, their signets. All of their mana rocks, all of their artifacts, you're going to want to take them. You're probably not going to take creatures, 
because you put her down on the field, they're going to kill her before their tur- before your next turn comes out. You're going to want to play her on turn 6, 7, or 8 when you have enough mana to play the card you stole. Because once you play the card you stole, it does not go back to the one health taker leaves the field. The card is no longer exiled, it is permanently yours until they destroy it. Which, if they do destroy it, you just made them take out a resource, you just take their card back. It's great. And if they destroy it, it doesn't go back into the control, it goes directly to the graveyard, which is even better. Honestly, one of the MVPs of this deck is Hosh Taker. I've stolen Soul Rings, I've stolen Signets. Then you go to your treasure generators. These are cards that solely focus on generating treasure and doing and not doing that much else. First one was Revel and Riches, as we talked about earlier. It also creates your shoguns on its own. It is the main focus of this deck. You also have Pitiless Plunder, which is a 4 mana 1 for Human Pirate. The reason I have this under treasure generators and not under creatures is because you're going to treat him more like an enchantment than a creature. Because you're never going to attack with him, you're not really going to block with him that much. He's just putting down the field, you could put him with your other enchantments, you're never going to realize he's a creature. Whenever another creature you control dies, you create a treasure token. Simple, straight to the point, it gets the job done, it feeds your Revelin Riches. Then Brass of Bounty. This card is absolutely amazing late game. You pay 7 mana, get treasure tokens equal to the number of lands you control. You play this card, you now have basically two, 2 turns your next turn. You have basically double the mana you can spend the following turn. Which is really, really good around turn 7, 8, 9. Or if you don't have anything to play, you could just win off Rebel and Riches right off the bat. You don't have to worry, you could have 0 tokens on the field, play Brass and Bounty, you have more than 10 now. Spell Swindle, favorite card, my personal favorite card of the whole deck is Spell Swindle. It's a 5 mana counter t- counter spell. Counter target spell, you create X colorless treasure tokens equal to the converted mana cost of the spell you countered. They play their big commander, they play their giant Eldrazi, just counter it, get a bunch of treasure tokens, win the next turn of Evelyn Riches. Again, you could have zero tokens in the field, counter 10 mana creature, 10 mana enchantment, 10 mana anything, you win. Next, you have Storm of the Vault, which is one of the flip cards from Rivals of Ixalan. You pay 4 mana for an enchantment This says whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to the player, you create a treasure token. You're going to be creating so many treasure tokens from this. You're getting at least one every turn because you're going to want to attack every turn. At the beginning of your end step, if you control 5 or more artifacts, artifacts. Not treasure tokens, artifacts in general. Again, your soul rings, your mana rocks, your signets, your weapons, your pirate ship, any of them will trigger Storm of the Vault. It flips into Vault of Catlacan. Catlacan? Catlacan. It taps for one mana of any color, or it taps for one for blue, equal to the amount of artifacts you control, which is going to be five. You're going to have at least five artifacts when this land flips. Tapping one land for five mana is great, really, really great, and it's going to it's going to flip a lot. It always flips within one or two turns from the turn you played. It's turn four. You have a bunch of mana rocks on the field. You have treasure stones on the field. It's probably going to transform with the turn you played anyway. Next, you have treasure map. It's just a two mana treasure artifact. You pay one tap. It's scry one great you throw out lands you don't need anymore throw out treasure i mean throw out pirates that you don't need put a landman counter on treasure map once you have put three or more landman counter landmark counters on it you transform it to treasure crow which taps for any color i mean taps for colorless or you could tap it sacrifice the treasure or draw a card this thing starts drawing you a card every turn late game because you're going to have treasure tokens that just cover the field you're going to have like in the double digit treasure tokens you don't mind losing like three or four over four turns to draw an extra card every turn Card draw is key in this deck. Your hand is going to be empty once you hit turn 6 or 7. Having an extra card draw every turn is just great. It's going to transform us always, and the scrying is just a bonus at this point. Now we're moving to your overall mana ramp. These are the cards that allow you to play big things really early, or multiple pirates, in quick succession. You play one of every signets, which, why wouldn't you? You play a Pillar of Origins. It's a 2-mana artifact. Whenever enter the field, you choose the creature type, and you add 1 mana of any color to your mana pool. Spend this mana to cast creature spells of the chosen type, which is only pirates. It's all the creatures you're going to run. Overall, just more mana ramp and more mana fixing. Then you run a commander sphere, because why wouldn't you? You run a soul ring, because it's soul ring. And you also roll dancing dagger. It is a 2-mana artifact equipment that when enter the battlefield, you choose an opponent. They get two zero two green plant creature tokens with defender. And the equipped creature gets plus two, plus one, and whenever the equi- equipped creature deals combat damage from the player, you transform it. This is amazing in Commander. This card is really, really bad in Constructed, because you only have one opponent, and you're basically giving them the defenders that stop you from attacking with the creature you're attacking with. 
this works really well with the politics of Commander. Let's say you have a big dude. Well, not. No, it could also be a literal big dude, but just a dude that's a threat. He's going to kill you guys unless you guys kill him. You could just nudge the person to your side and be like, okay, look, I'm going to give you these tokens. You can live. Help me out killing him. Or early game, give somebody the tokens, attack somebody else, and flip it. Loss flips into Lost Fail, which taps, adds three mana of any one color to your mana pool, more mana ramp, and it's color mana, which is even better. Now you go to your card draw. You have a lot of mana, a lot of creatures, a lot of them are low cost, you're going to want to draw a lot of cards. First one is Pirate's Prize. Four mana, draw two cards, create a token, symbol. You get the cards you need, get the tokens you need, advance your wave conditions, good. Curious Obsession is a one mana enchantment, enchant creature, the enchanted creature gets plus one, plus one, and has, whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, you may draw a card. Really good early game, you're, nobody else, not that many people are going to be playing tokens or creatures early in the game because it's commander they're going to focus on big strong creatures for the first two or three turns get a couple card draws out of this at worst you're going to get one card out of this card and it's a one mana draw card which is good anybody would play a one mana draw one card it's being an advanced step if you don't attack with a creature sacrifice it doesn't matter if you're not attacking it probably means you're either losing or you have control of the board opt one mana, scry one, draw a card, very simple. Get rid of cards you don't need, draw a card. Again, mainly here for the pirate flavor. Kindred Discovery, this card is amazing. It's a five mana enchantment. When into the battlefield, you choose creature type, pirate, whenever you control, pirate you control enters the battlefield, or attacks, you draw a card. So if you put a creature with haste, like Captain Lannery Storm, like the Stormfleet Sprinter, you play them, Draw a card, they attack right away, you draw another card. All of your haste creatures now suddenly have draw two cards along with them. So you play a pirate, let's say your hand is empty, you top deck this. I mean, you don't top it, you have this on the field, you top deck a pirate. Play a pirate, draw a card, it's a pirate, play that pirate, draw another card, draw pirate haste, play that pirate, draw a card, attack with the one haste pirate, draw two cards. This card just made you go from no cards to two cards in hand, three cards in pirate. Three pirates on the field for nothing. And it keeps going. There's very little enchantment removal, and people are going to be wanting to get rid of your Revel and Riches instead of this. This is the engine of your deck. It'll just keep you running and keep you drawing cards, keep you hitting really hard. Now you run Secret to the Golden City, which is a three mana. Draw two cards. If you have the City's Blessing, you draw three cards instead. Again, if you're playing this, it's late game. You've dumped a bunch of creatures on the field, a bunch of land, a bunch of tokens. Yeah, the treasure tokens count as permanents. You're triggering Ascend whenever at this point. Draw three cards for three mana, that's fine. Charter course, two mana, draw two cards, discard a card unless you attack this turn. You're going to attack every single turn. You're drawing two cards for two mana. Very good value. You're going to want to run it. This is one of those iffy cards. Vance's Blasting Cannons, which is a four mana enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top card of your library. If it's a non line card, you can cast that card this turn. It's basically in your hand for that turn. Whenever you cast your third spell on a turn, you may transform Vance's Blasted Cannon. This card is a double-edged sword. You're drawing an extra card of your turn, but out of nowhere, you suddenly just banish your Kindred Spirit, your Kindred Discovery, your Kindred Charge. They're gone. You're not getting them back. Unless you have all of the mana to cast it. And if you do, you're probably not using them for their best use you could have a kindred charge go off turn four you don't have the matter to play it or if it's like turn seven you play it you have like three creatures on the field you're not winning that turn it's not good so honestly if you're trying to cut cards in this deck this is one of the cards you're probably going to cut first but once it flips into spitfire bastion it taps for one red mana or three mana deal three damage to a target creature or player really good late game kill off small creatures kill off players good and you finally run one Vanquisher's Banner, which is a 5 mana artifact, gives all of your other pirates plus 1 plus 1, and whenever you cast a creature spell of the chosen type, you draw a card. Again, play that, leave it on the battlefield, play a pirate, draw a pirate, play a pirate, draw a pirate. Repeat till you win. Finally, you have your removal and your board wipe. First removal of the game is single target removal, which is walk the plank, 2 black mana for destroy target non merciful creature. If you run into the 1 commander player, into like the 11 commander players in the world that are running merfolk tribal as their command commander deck you're fresh out of luck but you're probably beating them anyway angrid's fury which is a five mana destroyer creature deal three damage to that 
to target player. It doesn't have to be the player whose creature you destroy. You can destroy one player's creature, deal three damage to another player, and you get to search for your Planeswalker Angra, which we'll talk about later. Krosis Charm, which is one blue, one black, one red. Choose one, return target permanent to the owner hand. That is against decks that like to summon things from the graveyard. Destroy a target non-black creature, just straight up kill spell. It can't regenerate it, or you destroy an artifact. You're not gonna be using the third one that much, unless you're facing like an artifact heavy deck that has like a planar bridge on the field and you need to get rid of that planar bridge. Terminate, one black, one red, kill something, destroy it, can't regenerate it, it's fine. Depth of the Sire, which is a three mana, return to a creature back to Thorn of Sand, create a token. This is mainly here for flavor and because you just need as many token producers as you can. Lightning Strike, two mana, deal three damage target creature player, just a good early game spell. Then you get to your board wipes, which is Fiery Carinade, three mana, deal two damage to each non pirate creature. This is your flavor card of the deck, more flavor than actual utility, you can probably get better. Much better board wipes than this, but it's really good early game. You sometimes you're getting flooded by like one one cat tokens, one one vampire tokens. Get rid of them all before they get boosted. If somebody you're running against like a token heavy deck, they boost their tokens early, you're dying pretty quickly. Language, which is four mana, give all creatures negative four, negative four until return, just straight a board wipe for most of the mid game, early game. Yehenny's expertise. Same thing except it's minus three, minus three until alternate, and you get to cast a creature. I'm sorry, you get to cast any card with a converted mana cost 3 or less from your hand without paying its mana cost. I honestly prefer your hand's expertise because anything that gets killed by a 4 4, you're probably going to kill it with a 3 3, when you with a negative 3 3, and it gives you the first creature on the field right away. Next up is by Force, which is X and 1 red. You destroy X target artifacts. This card is your emergency, I'm about to die, I need to clear as much as I can. Press, a, press that button. Tap all your land, kill everybody's mana rocks, except yours, of course. Get rid of all their mana rocks, their soul rings, their divining tops, their signets, planar bridges, anything. Just destroy all of them. Put yourself onto the highest temple you can have. You suddenly have all the mana wrap. They don't. Really, really good card. And you run Blasphemous Act, which is eight colorless and one red. It deals 13 damage to each creature and costs one less to cast for each creature on the battlefield. If you are playing Blasphemous Act, it's going to cost like 2-3 mana. Because you're getting flooded. And you're a very creature heavy deck. So if you're pressing this button, just like by force, it means you're about to die. And you need to hit the reset button on the game. You need to get everything back on board, back on your side. Press it. Clear. Start over. Now we move on to utility cards. These are cards that mainly just give effects that help you out over the long term of the game, but they don't really fit into your win conditions. They just do things that help you out. First one is Angrath Minotaur Pirate, which is a six mana pirate Minotaur Planeswalker. He's your dude. He's your captain. All of your troops report to him mainly instead of Admiral Beckett Brass, because Beckett Brass is kind of shit. His plus two allows you to ping off smaller creatures and just get damage overall. His negative three is what he's mainly here for. You get to revive your hostage takers, revive your neckbreakers, revive your foreign of the coalition. Basically get your key value oriented pirates out back on the battlefield. His negative 11 will never happen, but if it happens, congrats, you won the game. Or you killed a player at least. If it's late game, you probably won on one at this point. Kill your opponent. Good. Next one is propaganda. You are weak. This deck is fragile. Your pirates are very small, and they don't know how to block. They don't know how to block at all. This this enchantment stops people from wanting to hit you. Hitting you doesn't become valuable because they got to pay two to hit you for every creature they control. It slows down the assault towards you. You can build up your pirates behind the wall. They can deal. They can take care of each other. Look at dispersal. It's three mana. Counter spell on this control base four, but honestly, you've been playing two. 2 mana total to play this most of the time, and a 2 mana counter spell is great. You run Duress to get rid of any deck that you see is starting to search a lot. They start to tutor a lot of cards, and you need to get rid of those cards before they play it or cast them. Take them out of their hand, discard them, you're good. Lightning Recruit is a 3 mana creature, Goblin Pirate. Again, I have him here instead of the creature, because he's mainly another enchantment in creature form, just like your Pitiless Plunderer. Tap him, deal 1 damage to each opponent, untap him whenever you play a pirate. Now, what you want to do is you want to have it on the field, have either Kindred, Kindred Discovery on the field or Vanquisher's Banner on the field, play a pirate, 
I mean, tap him, play a pirate, untap him, draw a card, play a card, untap him, tap him, draw a card, play a card, untap him, tap him. You've dealt three damage for no reason at this point. Always want to have him in the deck. He is a sleeper card. They People look at him and they're like, oh, one damage, it's nothing. And then they just took six damage in one of your turns. One of the best cards in the game. I mean, in the deck, you have your Fell Flagship, the three mana artifact vehicle. Pirates you control get plus one, plus zero, and whenever it deals combat damage to player, that player discards the card with a crew of three. You're not really going to crew him that much, and if you are, its effect is okay, but it's mainly the plus one attack that you're going to want to get off of it. Its plus one also lets your smaller pirates crew him. So your Pitiless Plunderer that's been on the board for like seven turns, hasn't attacked, hasn't blocked, you can tap him, crew this, that's fine. You probably got the Pitiless Plunder boosted enough, you're good. Next up we have Counterspell, because it's Counterspell and you don't. You have no reason to not run Counterspell. Now that's it for the cards in this deck. The rest are lands. You only run 35 lands, because again, your overall curve is pretty early. 35 lands is more than enough. You're good. I've tested this out repeatedly. I've taken out more lands. Dropping below 35 isn't that good, and going anything over 37, you're getting mana flooded way too much. The very tight-knit amount of mana that I've pretty, pretty much put into this deck, 35 is fine. If you feel like you want to add more, add more, but honestly, 35, 36, that's your sweet spot. Now, as to ways you can enhance this deck, because overall, this is a very casual deck. You're not running the best cards you can possibly get, mainly because I'm not rich. I don't have money to drop into like a bunch of high-cost lands, high-cost artifacts. But these are really some good ideas to upgrade it. You can throw in more chests of the Black Girls, like we talked earlier, a much better commander. She's not really that expensive, but I just don't play her because she's not really the most flavorful commander to run. Why would more chests of the Black Girls be leading a bunch of pirates? It doesn't make any sense, but if you want to play competitively, you actually probably don't want to play this deck, but you know what? Throw her in, makes the, the deck better overall. Damnation, a much better board clear. Four mana, just destroy everything they can be regenerated. I don't have the money to drop on it, but if you do, feel free, add Damnation, take out a Fire Cannonade, or take out a Languish. Add a Metallic Mimic, it enters the battlefield, choose a creature type, Pirate. Metallic Mimic, it becomes a Pirate, and whenever another creature you control that's a Pirate enters the battlefield, it gets a plus one, plus one counter, it makes your small Pirates really big, really quickly. Put him in whenever you can afford him. Switch out, I would recommend switching out either one of the combat-oriented pirates, or one of the value-oriented pirates. You don't want to lose treasure-producing pirates. They're your key. They're your win condition. You don't want to get rid of them. Run Kindred Dominance, which is five colorless black-black. Choose a creature type, pirates. Destroy creatures that aren't pirates. Your Metallic Mimic becomes a pirate. You don't have to worry about it. Kindred Dominance, clear the board for anybody that isn't you. Unless you're doing a mirror match with another pirate, in which case... You have found a friend. Go make friends with this person. Make a truth. You both won the game. Now, this is my favorite part of these, this upgrade section of the video. You can switch your commander out for Brea Ethereum Shaper. You could add white to the cards you are allowed to play. Now, when she enters the battlefield, you create two 1-1 one, one blue Thopter artifact creature tokens the flying. You don't care about that. Here's the part you care about. You pay to sacrifice two artifacts. You either deal 3 damage to target player, you get rid of a creature, or you gain 5 life. She is really good with the treasure tokens. You can sack 2 treasure tokens. Ideally, you're going to have a bunch of treasure tokens. She's going to make use of them and make this deck so much better. Now, you have white. So what are you going to put into the deck that's white? How does white work with her? Well, unknown to procession. So 4 mana enchantment, whenever an effect would create 1 or more tokens on your control, it creates twice that many tokens. Revel and Riches, it works twice as fast now. Pitiless Plunder, twice as fast. Stuff like your Spell Swindle, you just countered a 5 mana spell for 10 mana and tokens. Wonderful. Wrath of God, because you're running Damnation, throw in a Wrath of God, same thing. Ghostly Prison, 3 mana Propaganda. For redundancy's sake, you are now running 2 copies of Propaganda. Stop them from attacking you, let yourself live, build up your board. Swim for game later in the game. Add a Sensei's Divining Top, because why wouldn't you run it? I personally don't like the card, simply because it's really overplayed. Now you're saying, why do I run Soul Ring? And I'm saying, Soul Ring is a lot more useful to me than Sensei's Divining Top, and I know people have to argue that. I'm on the Soul Ring side of it. But if you want to put Divining Top in, feel free. You would also want to add a Cyclonic Rift, because I 
haven't gone around to buy a copy of Cyclonic Rift, but if you manage to already have one, have an extra one, or don't mind dropping the, what, $12 for it, go ahead, throw it in. It's amazing. It could be a win condition of its own. You could also add Herald's Horn, which is a three-mana artifact. As another of you choose a creature type, it's going to be pirates. Creature spells you cast as the chosen type cost one less to cast. These are your pirates. They're coming out faster, better. You get to, at the beginning of your upkeep, you look at the top card of your library. If it's a creature card, you put it into your hand. It says it's a chosen type, but every creature you're running is a pirate, except for the artifact of imagination. But you might as well treat that as an enchantment instead of a creature. And you draw the pirate. Great card. And you know what, throw in Jace a Mind Sculptor because why not? At this point you're just throwing flavor out the window, put in a Jace a Mind Sculptor. And that one just good roll with it. So that's the deck type. Now we can review the overall mana curve of this deck. As you can see you're really looking at the early early game at two to three mana spells. You're running a couple of late game, but not that much, because you are focused on cre creating treasure tokens. You're not looking to go into the late game to hit for game. You're looking into the late game to win with and riches. Mid game, you can hit with your pirates and kill people. This deck mainly focuses on stepping away from everything, attacking when you need to, which you're going to attack a lot, but people are going to feel really threatened by you because you're not hitting them for that much early game. And then just come out of nowhere, revel and riches, you win. Or have them hit each other, lower their life totals to a point where you could just play your kindred charge or your artifact imagination and swing for the last 20-ish damage that you need to do. Well, thanks for listening. This is your Commander Deck Tech. Go sail, go find treasures, be happy.